Hi everybody, this is Dr. Hatsuma Busayed, board certified surgeon and plastic surgeon. Uh, we'll be presenting a lecture today as part of a lecture series on the acute abdomen. This is going to be volume one where we'll be talking about the anatomy and history and physical examination components of evaluating patients with the acute abdomen. We'll talk a little bit about the surface anatomy uh, and the internal anatomy. We'll talk about uh, key components of a history including uh, present illness history, uh, past medical history, medications, and other components. And we'll talk about uh, key elements of the physical examination, including some specific signs that are uh, commonplace signs that may indicate specific diseases. In a subsequent lecture volume, we'll talk about some specific conditions that are commonly diagnosed uh, in the evaluation of the acute abdomen uh, with some of their telltale clinical signs and symptoms. Um, radiographic findings and, uh, uh, and other aspects. So this will sort of give you an overall perspective on how to evaluate the patient uh, presenting with acute abdominal pain and then um, just some commonplace clinical vignettes uh, that you might encounter in an emergency room setting, in, in an office as a primary care provider, or certainly if you uh, are a provider in surgical specialties that might come across quite commonly. So let's go ahead and proceed. So the first uh, thing I'd like to talk about is our objectives. Our objectives for this lecture are to first to define what is the acute abdomen. Um, we'll talk about the important uh, pertinent anatomy for the evaluation of the abdomen, how to take a proper history, how to do a proper physical examination with some uh, specific commonplace signs, and we'll talk about relevant laboratory and radiographic data. So if I can give you no other piece of advice, this is probably the best piece I can give you, which is to go out and buy Cope's Early Diagnosis of the Acute Abdomen. This is a, um, a publication that has been um, used by surgeons and uh, residents um, for many decades. And I still have here, I believe, my original copy from when I was a medical student. And See, it's well worn. Cope's early diagnosis of the acute abdomen. I have the 18th edition, and uh, in the graphic there, you're seeing the 19th edition. Uh, and in this book are key explanations of how to evaluate the patient, differential diagnoses, um, commonplace um, diagnostic vignettes, and uh, it's just very well organized. So, this is a must read for anybody interested in learning about the acute abdomen. Um, and while I'm at it showing you some of my books, uh, this is another very good book to read about um, uh, a variety of different surgical subjects. Um, it's called Surgical Secrets. This is a much older edition. I'm sure this has gone through probably five or more revision editions since then. Um, you can still see my little dog ear tabs for different subjects when I was studying for my surgical rotation as a medical student um, almost 20 years ago. So. Um, with that, let's go ahead and proceed. So what do we mean when we talk about an acute abdomen? What does that mean? So typically that's abdominal pain that's present. So what do we mean by the acute abdomen? A definition. So this is typically a patient presenting with acute abdominal pain of usually less than 24 hours duration. It may be 24 to 36 or even 48 hours as some of these conditions may begin slowly or insidiously and gradually increase in severity. Um, and often patients may be thinking that they have indigestion or some other mild condition that may be self-limiting and not necessarily come to attention um, of a physician until uh, the uh, condition has escalated. Um, many of the conditions that lead to acute abdominal pain and uh, the presentation of the acute abdomen are life-threatening um, uh, and the pain is usually eventually quite severe. Not every condition that is in the differential diagnosis for acute abdomen is something that needs surgery, however. So there are certainly conditions, and I'll list a few, um, that don't necessarily require surgical intervention to manage, but it's generally a good idea to uh, involve general surgeons um, and sometimes other surgical specialties in the evaluation of patients with the acute abdomen early um, so you can rule out surgical emergencies and um, reduce morbidity and mortality. So the earlier a diagnosis is made of something, say, like appendicitis, acute cholecystitis, um, pelvic inflammatory disease, et cetera, 
uh, the uh, earlier that the physicians and nurses can intervene and potentially um, avoid life-threatening or other debilitating complications. So you're probably familiar, uh, these have some passive familiarity with some of the most common causes of the acute abdomen. Um, acute appendicitis is sort of a classic teaching case uh, of um, pain presenting with a fairly specific historical pattern, um, patients giving a history of pain that evolves in a certain way, certain location with certain associated symptoms and, and physical examination signs. Um, and in uh, volume two of our acute abdomen series, we'll talk more specifically about some of these diagnoses. Um, acute cholecystitis or in inflammation and infection of the gallbladder, another very commonly presenting cause for acute abdomen. Small bowel obstruction, uh, pancreatitis and other pancreatic conditions. Diverticular disease, typically um, acute diverticulitis, uh, often perforated with an abscess or a phlegmon, an inflammatory mass presenting. Um, perforated peptic ulcer disease, uh, gastritis and other upper gastrointestinal conditions, and uh, idiopathic causes. So let's talk about uh, the anatomy. So when we think of acute abdomen, obviously we're thinking typically of gastrointestinal causes of abdominal pain. Most of the organs in the abdomen and that have uh, nerve pathways that would trigger abdominal pain um, with pathology are uh, gastrointestinal organs. But there are obviously other structures that live in the abdomen and pelvis and the retroperitoneum that uh, may contribute to the perception of abdominal pain. So these can include vascular causes like uh, aortic dissection or a leaking or rupturing abdominal aortic aneurysm, mesenteric artery thrombosis of the superior mesenteric or inferior mesenteric artery systems, um, genitourinary causes like kidney stones, ureteral spasm, uh, ovarian torsion, testicular torsion, um, and even uh, ectopic pregnancy, and even um, some uh, just uh, severe examples of normal processes like ovulation with middle schmerz, pain in the mid-cycle of ovulation uh, in women in childbearing uh, ages where, um, uh, where the process of ovulation can cause very severe acute abdominal pain, sometimes mimicking appendicitis or other conditions. Um, so to be able to evaluate a patient who presents with an acute abdomen, it's really important to understand the boundaries anatomically of the abdomen and pelvis. So we'll show you some graphics of that in a second. And um, uh, to just generally understand where you can typically expect certain signs to uh, be detectable on examination. So the boundaries of the abdomen and pelvis uh, run from the xiphoid process of the sternum, so the bottom of the sternum, down to the pelvis, um, to the levator ani and the inguinal ligaments and includes um, the anterior, from the anterior peritoneal surface all the way back to the posterior peritoneum and involving um, the retroperitoneal structures as well. Um, and it's important to also know commonplace locations for hernias, obviously inguinal hernias uh, in the groin, but um, uh, spigalian hernias um, along the um, linea semilunaris, along the lateral aspect of the rectus abdominis muscle, uh, uh, ventral hernias that may present through previous incisions in the midline or in other parts of the abdomen, uh, etc. The anatomy of the abdomen um, is probably best studied thinking in terms of the embryonic origins of different structures. So as you may recall from embryology, the uh, developing embryo um, will, the gastrointestinal aerodigestive tract will actually evolve from a foregut component, a midgut component, and a hindgut component. And these actually have different um, uh, basic blood supply routes that then evolve into the vascular systems that serve certain portions of the gastrointestinal tract. So when we think about the organs of the GI tract, uh, the foregut is basically fed by the celiac trunk, which is one of the first uh, branches off of the um, abdominal aorta after, it pass after the aorta passes through the diaphragm. And um, the organs that are derived from the foregut include the esophagus, the spleen, the stomach, the liver and hepatobiliary trees, the gallbladder, pancreas, and the first and second parts of the duodenum. So the uh, portions basically proximal to the ligament of trites um, uh, are uh, derived from the foregut, and actually even more proximal than the ligament of trites. Um, the retroperitoneal portion of the duodenum 
first and second portions um, are, uh, are derived from the foregut. <clears throat> the midgut vascular uh, blood supply is derived from the, uh, or evolves into the superior mesenteric arterial system, um, which feeds uh, the distal part of the duodenum, the third and fourth port parts of the duodenum, the jejunum and ileum, uh, the cecum and appendix, and the ascending colon, and about the first two-thirds of the transverse colon. And there's very rich mesenteric arcade uh, that receives blood supply from the superior mesenteric artery system that also then arborizes or communicates with sort of like a two trees roots kind of intermingling uh, along with the blood supply from the hindgut, uh, the inferior mesenteric artery, which is um, that distal most component of the colon uh, from the distal third of the transverse colon splenic flexure and down the uh, left uh, hemicolon, the sigmoid colon, and the uh, rectum and upper anal canal. Um, obviously the distal anus uh, is uh, below the dentate line is part of the, uh, the um, it's actually below the pelvis, um, but uh, this is a basic anatomy both of the vascular structures and the, um, uh, the structures that evolve from the foregut and mid-gut and hindgut progenitors in the end. So the upper GI, the other way we sort of divide this is into the upper GI tract and the lower GI tract. So the upper GI tract is basically from the lips to the ileocecal valve. So you commonly think of the upper GI system uh, being the esophagus, stomach, duodenum, and uh, small intestine. And then the lower GI tract uh, is commonly uh, considered the, uh, from the cecum and appendix, so distal to the ileocecal valve all the way to the anus. And, um, you know, the boundary is sometimes uh, defined a little bit different in terms of where the small intestine may have um, be considered partly upper GI, partly lower GI. But in broad categories, um, this is a pretty good subdivision to learn. So here's a nice cartoon showing uh, the structures uh, of the um, of the abdomen that would be pertinent in the evaluation of the acute abdomen. There are other structures not shown here, the kidneys, uh, adrenal glands, ureters, and so on, but at least as far as the gastrointestinal and vascular system, this is a pretty good uh, diagram to study. So we see our esophagus proximally. Um, we see that uh, entering uh, the stomach, the stomach giving rise to the duodenum, uh, the pancreas hugging the uh, duodenum in a retroperitoneal position. Um, the uh, duodenum evolving into the ileum, we see a lot of the small intestine, excuse me, into the jejunum. We see this jejunum and ileum, the whole small intestine sort of clustered there uh, in the lower part of the picture. Uh, and then through the ileocecal valve, uh, the small intestine gives rise to the colon or large intestine with the vermiform appendix, or appendix for short, um, sticking out as a largely vestigial structure, although it may be that the appendix serves a um, lymphoproliferative immune function. Um, it is, it's not entirely clear um, uh, how important that function is of the uh, appendix, and, and so obviously the appendix can often be uh, spared and has to be removed, of course, typically in cases of acute appendicitis, at least in terms of historical management of appendicitis. Uh, although currently there is a little bit more interest in, in um, observation with antibiotics and non-surgical management of very early diagnosed appendicitis. Um, giving, um, emphasizing uh, the importance of early diagnosis again, that the, the conditions that used to be considered uh, acute surgical emergencies can sometimes now be managed with um, a little bit more expectant management, not necessarily rushed to the operating room. And that's as we learn more and more about the natural history of these conditions and also we have better medical therapies like uh, better quality uh, and more broad spectrum antibiotics and uh, better diagnostic techniques like CT scans and other uh, studies to help us make diagnoses earlier. Um, you can see in this cartoon as well the, um, the basic segmental blood supply coming off of the aorta um, and the venous blood supply with the portal venous system being particularly important. The superior mesenteric vein here in the uh, middle of the picture um, uh, has an intimate relationship to the pancreas um, and uh, to the uh, drainage from the uh, or or actually the inflow of, um, of blood into the liver uh, carrying uh, absorbed nutrients from the uh, blood from the uh, carrying absorbed nutrients from the gastrointestinal tract. It's important not to forget 
that there are other endocrine organs like the adrenals and uh, um, the spleen as a, as a uh, hematopoietic or um, uh, hematologic organ. Uh, have intimate relationships with uh, other organs and can be the sources of acute abdominal pain. Um, and understanding the hepatobiliary di uh, anatomy, the liver, the gallbladder, and the bile ducts, the pancreas and pancreatic ducts, and how those structures uh, um, interrelate, and how they interrelate with the duodenum and the stomach, how they interrelate with the, uh, with the peritoneal um, cavity and with the retroperitoneum. Um, are very important. Again, as we said, we don't want to forget that uh, the renal system, including the kidneys, ureters, and bladder, may be causes of acute abdominal pain. Um, and uh, the intrapelvic uh, uh, genital organs like the uterus, uh, and ovaries, and fallopian tubes in females in particular, undescended testes in males, and radiated uh, pain from uh, testicular origin, even in males with descended testes. These can all be sources of acute uh, abdominal pain that is of an anatomic Origin. So here we see a diagram showing some of the relationships in the lower abdomen and pelvis and the retroperitoneum with the vascular blood supply, including the aorta and the vena cava, the um, gonadal vessels, which have different um, anatomy on the right and left side, uh, their relationship to the ureter. We talk about water going under the bridge um, with the ureters passing um, underneath uh, vascular structures and uh, on their way down to the bladder. Um, and uh, you can also see uh, a little bit of the interrelationship here with some of the neural structures uh, that feed the pelvis and the proximal thigh region. Um, and as we talk about nerves um, and blood supply, again, let's review the celiac trunk, superior mesenteric artery and vein, uh, inferior mesenteric artery, the abdominal aorta, proper and its uh, common iliac branches, which then divide into the internal and external iliac vessels. Um, and the neural anatomy, um, the abdominal structures are innervated by splanchnic nerves. Um, and there is an important distinction to be drawn between our typical somatic pain, which often travels along skeletal nerves um, that are um, sensory nerves, uh, where there is more of a, a, a cortical cognition of the location of the source of pain uh, versus visceral pain, which may um, uh, arise from the distension of abdominal structures uh, or inflammatory reaction, inflammatory um, or inflammation of nerve endings in the abdomen, but may actually be referred to other anatomic locations um, based on uh, the origin of the splanchnic nerve um, components. So here's another cartoon showing the blood supply with the small intestine uh, and the upper GI tract and hepatobiliary structures kind of removed from the picture. So you can see this rich intercommunication from the superior mesenteric artery uh, structures superiorly, um, giving rise to the um, middle colic, right colic, and ileocolic blood vessels. And then uh, the inferior mesenteric artery giving rise to the left colic and sigmoid branches on uh, superior rectal, middle and inferior rectal vessels, and this sort of uh, this arcade called the marginal artery uh, or marginal artery of Drummond that allows um, communication of the blood supply between the SMA and IMA territories. Uh, and that can be a very important um, issue uh, in terms of maintaining vascularity to the uh, large intestine if there is occlusion thr or thrombosis in one of the other um, blood supply regions. Uh, so this redundancy is a big part of how we are structured as organisms um, and helps to protect us from certain catastrophic events. But um, this, this arborization or communication is not always complete. Um, and so you may have territories that we call watershed territories where there is no intercommunication. There's almost like a uh, boundary between uh, two uh, water supplies that can't cross that boundary. Uh, and so that area may be uh, subject to um, increased risk if there is blockage, inflammation, or some other event that uh, may compromise the blood supply. Here again, another cartoon just showing the uh, blood vessels without the organs in place. Um, and we won't belabor this, but this is a good, um, simple cartoon to study, uh, to look at the branches of the abdominal aorta and how they relate to um, the, uh, the skeleton and, and muscle boundaries of the um, 
uh, retroperitoneum posteriorly and um, the uh, diaphragm superior. And I apologize for the, the, this is maybe not the clearest graphic, but this is derived from Gray's Anatomy showing the splanchnic uh, nerve blood supply and uh, showing that there is a segmental blood supply, um, excuse me, the splanchnic innervation and showing a segmental innervation of structures in the aerodigestive tract as well as other solid organs uh, deriving from different segments along the um, spinal cord um, evolution. So uh, I won't go into the details of this uh, slide, but uh, it is important to uh, study the splanchnic uh, nerve blood su nerve su Jesus. It is imp it is important to study the splanchnic innervation of the gut as part of understanding how pain may be referred from one location internally to surface um, locations, such as the shoulder from the right upper quadrant, uh, et cetera. When we look at the surface anatomy of the abdomen, we commonly divide it into several regions. Um, the simplest division is to just divide it into four quadrants, the right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. Um, there's a little bit more subtlety if you divide this into uh, nine general territories on the anterior abdomen, um, with the hypochondriac and epigastric regions being in the upper third of the abdomen, the umbilical and uh, flank or lumbar regions being in sort of the mid-abdomen around the belly button, and then uh, the iliac and hypogastric regions being below the belly button and above the um, pubis and the inguinal ligaments. Um, and by thinking it through in a framework with these sort of nine territories, you can then um, uh, formulate based on the internal anatomy versus the surface anatomy, what structures may, may sit behind uh, the skin and muscle and fascia uh, and be able to be palpated on exam or may uh, refer pain uh, that's uh, felt as tenderness on exam in specific regions. Many of the causes of acute abdomen do not necessarily radiate to a very focused location for pain, although I'll show you some examples of ones that do. Um, many of the other conditions will lead to a generalized tenderness of the abdomen, generalized pain uh, that may not be well localized or may not be um, manifest as point tenderness on a specific point on, on the abdomen when you palpate the, the abdomen during an examination. So. Um, but this is a good framework to think through where the organs sit and where you might expect, say, um, a perforated uh, ulcer or, um, uh, or a, uh, a case of acute cholecystitis to present sort of in the upper abdomen or right upper quadrant uh, versus, say, appendicitis that typically presents in the right lower quadrant or acute diverticulitis, which often presents in the left lower quadrant. Um, but even there, there are subtleties like right-sided diverticulitis that uh, can present on the right side. So um, good framework for uh, understanding the surface anatomy. And this takes that further in what we were just talking about and showing us uh, some of the common conditions that would typically present with patterns of anatomic locations of abdominal pain. So perforated organs, like a ruptured um, colon, perforated um, small bowel, either spontaneously perforated from an infectious process or even iatrogenically perforated during a colonoscopy or some other procedure, will often present with diffuse abdominal pain and abdominal rigidity, um, spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which is a diffuse condition, um, uh, would be expected to have diffuse pain, and even non-surgical and what I call kind of non-anatomic conditions that lead to acute abdominal pain, like diabetic ketoacidosis, por acute porphyria, um, hypercalcemia, lead toxicity, and others may present with a generalized diffuse abdominal pain and maybe diffuse tenderness on examination um, as opposed to being highly localized. While we're talking about pain and tenderness, let's digress for a moment into explaining, again, for those uh, who may confuse signs and symptoms, uh, what we mean by pain versus tenderness. So <clears throat> uh, in the medical lingo, a symptom is, a, um, is something that the patient is experiencing, that the patient describes to uh, their caregivers, um, something they feel. Um, it's sort of the patient's perception of what's going on with their body. So if I have pain in my abdomen, I describe that as uh, abdominal pain. I have pain. I feel pain inside. 
and that pain exists even when nobody is examining me or touching uh, my skin or pushing on my abdomen. Um, tenderness is a sign, so it's a sign on physical examination. Signs are objective findings that we um, can detect either through physical examination, uh, laboratory studies, radiographic studies, or other either invasive or non-invasive um, procedures that help to make a diagnosis. Um, and so uh, a sign of a patient who has abdominal pain may be their body habit is how they are carrying themselves. They may be holding themselves very still. They may be doubled over uh, in a fetal position. They may be writhing. Um, it also uh, will include things like vital signs. Uh, they may have a fever, tachycardia, may have hypotension. Um, on physical examination of the abdomen, they may have a sign like abdominal tenderness, which is the perception that the patient has pain when examined. Um, so tenderness is distinct from uh, just the perception of pain alone. Um, there are other signs that I'll talk about that uh, a lot of them have names when we talk about the acute abdomen um, based on uh, common place presentations.